program execute itself for a period of time in a virtual environment, unpack itself, decrypt itself, and then once it's out in the clear in this virtual machine, they go and scan it for the virus, uh, for their virus signatures and can identify it. Then, of course, if they do identify something by signature, there's a remediation database that says what to do with this. Can we clean it? Do we have to delete it? Can we uh, block access to it? Antivirus is an after-the-fact solution, this kind of scanning. So most commercial antivirus has on-access virus scanning. It's one of the major components to it, where it blocks accesses to files as they're happening in situations where they've got a virus inside them. So here we've got a little picture of this. Here's the in kernel mode, we've got an antivirus fil file system filter driver, which is able to see all file system activity on the entire machine as it comes down from user mode into, into the kernel. And it communicates with an antivirus service up in user mode that is the maintaining this signature database. So the application makes a file I.O. The antivirus dri driver stops the I.O., communicates with the service. The service looks in the signature database to see if there's a match, and if there's not, lets the file I.O. through. So antivirus is basically dependent on signatures, though. A small outbreak might not ever get a signature. And there's also a window of exposure, of course, between a virus outbreak and the antivirus to community developing signatures and rolling this out to machines on the Internet. So alternate prevention mechanisms for viruses are absolutely 100% necessary. Firewalls on the inside of your network and on the outside, because the perimeter, as we I hope you all are aware of by now, is not just how you're facing the Internet, but it's the machines within your network as well, because your end users are bringing in laptops from the road with stuff on them. Intrusion prevention is another one, and I think it's eventually where we're all headed with this is restrictions on what code executes on end user machines, where you're going to be locking down exactly what content they are allowed to run. And one of the ways you can do that already today is with software restriction policies, a feature of, server, of Windows XP and Server 2003. Another major aspect of uh, alternate prevention mechanisms for viruses is uh, something called buffer overflow prevention. And to motivate buffer overflow prevention, I'm going to talk about some of the major virus outbreaks there have been in the last 10 years. So first of all, Melissa was the first ma Windows network worm. It was released in March of 99. And you probably, and I don't know what's going on with the slides here. A virus, yeah, probably. So let me refer to the printed slides here. Uh, the second one, which you can't read, is Code Red, which was released in July of 2001. It uh, exploited an IS buffer flow uh, vulnerability, and it infected 200,000 systems in nine hours, so very fast rate of uh, spreading. We planned a denial of service attack on the White House.gov site, which was actually never carried out. They were able to get ready for and prepare for that and stop it from being effective. The last one there on that slide is NIMDA, which was released in September of 2001. We all, of course, remember NIMDA admin spelled backwards, had 12 different propagation mechanisms, had several attack vectors, including the same attack vector that Code Red used, and it actually slowed down the Internet for several hours. Then there's Slapper in, in September of 2002. This is not a Windows-oriented virus, but actually one that was released to attack an open SSL vulnerability in Apache server, uh, a web server running on Linux systems to build a peer-to-peer -peer network for a massive denial of service attack. So that's the biggest Unix-related virus outbreak. SQL Slammer in January of 2003 exploits a SQL Server buffer overflow, caused a network flood. This one actually shut down ATM machines and delayed flights to certain airlines. And then Blaster in August of 2003 exploits a DCOM RPC buffer overflow to execute a denial of service attack on WindowsUpdate.com. I have to say, looking at this list, it's amazing that none of these were destructive. They were all denial of service attacks, essentially. So we, I think we've been extremely lucky so far. But also, if you look at these lists of these six major virus outbreaks, five of them have a common characteristic. Their vulnerability they exploited was the buffer overflow vulnerability. So what is a buffer overflow? A buffer overflow results when one function in a program calls another function. And the re record of where that second function should return to after it completes is stored on, in an area of memory called the stack. So this would be the return address on the stack. Function two, though, if it wants to allocate a, a buffer for use privately, it would allocate it also on the stack beneath the return address. If there's a programming error in, the, in function two where it accepts input from outside, 
and stores that in the buffer. That data is stored from the bottom of that buffer up through the stack. And a buffer overflow means that data will, will be written by that function up over the return address. And so an attacker, when they find this kind of problem in a program, can craft a buffer, can craft the input such that when function two tries to return to function one, it actually returns to code that's written into the buffer by the attacker. So that's the kind of control flow you'd have there if a buffer flow overflow was exploited. Microsoft's been working hard on the buffer overflow problem, given the fact that it's been the enabler for these major virus outbreaks. And in Visual Studio.net, starting in .NET 2003's release, it includes a flag called GS. What the GS flag does is places what's called a canary value on the stack beneath the return address. So if the, a buffer below that gets overflowed, it's going to screw up the canary. Now function two, before it, it returns to the return address, it checks to make sure the canary is the same value it had coming out of the function as it had going into the function. So it's kind of like check to see if the bird is dead. That means that the buffer, a buffer on that function has been overflowed and let's not return. Instead, it will halt and cause an access violation. This requires code to be recompiled to get the protection of this canary. All, Microsoft, all Windows code in XP Service Pack 2 and higher has been recompiled to take advantage of this switch. And in Windows XP Service Pack 2 and Server 2003, Service Pack 1, there's a new feature called Data Execution Prevention, or DEP, which actually prevents code from executing in memory pages not specifically marked as executable, because you should really, in uh, the vast majority of situations, not ever want to execute code on the stack like a buffer overflow exploit would do. Data execution pre prevention, though, requires hardware support. It requires the ability of the hardware to mark a page as non-executable. And believe it or not, this is something that's relatively recent in the world of Windows. Intel introduced data execution protection support in 2001 on their Itanium processor, but Windows didn't get support to it until just recently, for it until just recently. A lot of people think AMD was the first company to come out with this kind of hardware support, and they, when they released it, it was, they called it NX, or no execute. Of course, Intel had to, to copy, come along and copy, and they had to name it something else, right? Can't name it the same thing AMD did, and they call it Execute Disable, or XD. And there's a list of some of the processors. Initially, this feature was only present in 64-bit CPUs, and more recently, it's been introduced into 32-bit CPUs as well. So what happens when a buffer overflow tries to cause the execution of code on the stack? If the code is user mode code, like most of those vulnerabilities exploited, you get a, a data protection, a data execution prevention pop-up dialog box like the one you see there that says, to help protect your computer, Windows has closed this program. And it, in this case, it's Windows Explorer that I've caused to do that. In kernel mode, so not just the user mode components of the OS, like Explore and Solitaire and Notepad are protected, but also in kernel mode, things like the operating system kernel and the device drivers are also protected. And if one of those is, is exploited through a buffer overflow or somebody attempts to, in that case, you get a blue screen of death. And the stop code on the screen is attempted execute of no execute memory. Even on, uh, so on 32-bit windows, the way that you control depth is by going into the system applet. And so I'm going to do here. By going to my computer property and go to advanced and here in the performance area I'm not sure why they put this in performance it really has nothing to do with performance but click settings and go to data execution prevention and what you see here is it says data exe execution prevention helps protect it against damage from viruses and other security threats the default on Windows XP is the one that's selected there turn on depth for essential Windows programs and services only you see the other option there is turn on depth for all programs and services except that those I select. So with that default option, only the core OS files are protected, like Solitaire and Notepad, things that you're really concerned about. It's the other stuff, though, the third-party things that aren't protected. And the reason Microsoft put, made the default this way is that application compatibility showed that too many, stuff, too many things break with the all-on option. Games like to use kind of unpacking buffer execution techniques to hide themselves from uh, the hackers that want to get into the game and figure out how to break the licensing. That's just one category of programs that uh, will run into problems with, with depth turned on. 
However, I recommend you turn it on. 